We're, uh, we're recalculating a little bit. And basically what we're doing at the church is we're taking a look at where we've been. Uh, and recalculating has to do with this, that we, we uh, uh, like with a GPS, you know, you're driving along. And the example I used last week, and everybody kind of brought this up again to me this week, especially the kids. It's good. The kids have been listening. They, we were driving to the, to, the, uh, to the fish, catfish, mud bowl, whatever I call that, right? Uh, so we're driving to that, and I think it was, I think it was Bra- what, Braden? Probably. Yeah, he says, he, I, I, I said, boy, I'm not quite sure where I'm going. And that's mainly because Nathan was my navigator, right? <laughs> and, uh, and so I'm thinking, I'm thinking, wow, I, I'm not sure. So we had to pull over and all this, and he said, he said, are you seeing palm trees? That's what Brayden said, uh, because the example was we're driving, you know, we're driving along and we're going to Wisconsin. That's where we're headed to Wisconsin Dells, and all of a sudden we're seeing palm trees, and we're like, that's an indication that we need to recalculate. The person on the GPS is saying recalculate, recalculate, and you have to stop when you do that. You stop and you say, okay, where are we? That's what the recalculating. The lady in my cell phone or the lady in your GPS, she stops for a second and she says, she says, wait a second, where in the world are you? Right? And she figures that out and then she says, okay, uh, this is how, where, where are you going? Where are you going? Well, you got to know where you're going to go too. So, and then you have to determine the route you want to go because one of the, you can say, well, I don't want no freeways or I only want freeways or I don't want any tolls, right? That's what I always, I don't want no tolls, right? So you do all that and it's where we're going. And that's what we're doing as a church. We're taking a look at where we are, where we've been, and not just as a church. Um, some people think this is just about our church. It's not. Um, I, I, I really, I care about the kingdom of God. All right. I work for God. We work for God. Okay. We are God's people. We're his ambassadors. We're, we're, we're his. And so I'm here to encourage us. How do we as a community being, you know, led here, right? That's where we're at. How do we reach all these communities and how do we get there? That's the process we're going on right now. That's where we're at. And uh, so I'm excited to have some folks here that are kind of joining with us a little bit. But one of the questions I was asking as we looked at this was what's, what's the motivation? Um, yeah, reminds me of, of actors in Hollywood on the West Coast. That, you know, you, they've got something they're supposed to do. Well, what's my motivation? You know, what's, well, yeah, I, I can't do it right without the right motivation to make this, the scene go right. What's our motivation here as a church? Why do we want to reach people with the gospel? Why, why, why do we want our church to be, to, to grow? What, what's, the perp, what's the motivation here? And, I, and there's three things that I want to lay out that I think I would call them really not great motivation, but they're really popular motivation. They might be the motivation for some of you as to why you wanted, you want the things to change here and why you want things to go. The first one that I'll throw out is what I call self-preservation. Self-preservation. You don't want this church to die because you like this church and you got married in this church and your kid maybe got uh, confirmed in this church or was baptized here and your uh, you know you, you somebody that you love was was buried here and you have a lot of history here and that's the reason why you're clinging okay is that a good motivation I guess it's the question um, and, and here's what I want to explain is that a 30 year old couple that doesn't know Jesus does not care if you were married here, they don't, they don't care about that. They don't care that you were married here. They don't care that, uh, they, they don't really care much about the past. Um, what they care about is, well, this, is this church serving the needs or serving the vision that I have for the gospel or whatever? That's what they're caring about. So self-preservation, I do not believe is a good motivation for anything that we're about to do. If you're in this because you say, I just want to, I just want to save, I'm afraid that this will, I'm, af- I'm going to cling to this thing so that it doesn't die. If that's your motivation, that won't sustain you through this because there's going to be too many things that change and too many things that go and it won't be what it was before anyway. And you're clinging on, you're going to be a problem trying to cling on to the past and cling on to something that, that's either going to go away or, or, or not, right? So we got, we got to be careful about that. Self-preservation is not one. Another one, this is a really common one because a lot of churches go through this process. We're not the only ones going through this process. They want more money. That's a Chicago term, more money. We need, we need to keep the church up and going so we can get more money. And my question is, how's come? 
How's come? Why do you need more money? Because more money in the bank account isn't the purpose of God. That's not why he has us here. That's not why we're serving him. That's not the purpose of the church is to have money. The purpose of the church, right, is to fulfill the great commission and the great commandment. Fulfilling the great commission and fulfilling the great commandment is God's purpose for the church. It just is, okay? It's not to so that everybody everybody loves everybody. It's not so that everybody will be nice, right? Jesus didn't die to make you nice, okay? He died to redeem you from your sins. He didn't die so that we would all just get along and, and that we would have a nice time hanging out uh, and that we'd enjoy each other. That's a part of it, but that's not why. And so sometimes we're like, well, you know, we, we've been doing this a long time and it's, about, it's, about, it's all about money. That's not a good motivation. That won't sustain you through this process. It won't. The third one is you want more people. That's another Chicago term. More people. We want more people. Why do you want more people? Well, because we'll feel real good about ourselves if we, if we were a part of a change that really grew and, and we're in a church with a lot of people. We'll feel good about that. Bad motivation. Bad motivation. That's not going to sustain you. It's not about getting more people and just filling the building with people. Because you can fill a place with a bunch of sinners that never get redeemed. You can fill this place with hundreds of people all going to hell. That's not a good motivation. No, see, our motivation uh, is that we have to lead people to Jesus. It has to be a God-focused motivation. And we, each one of us, we need to take a good look at our heart. And we need to say, God, what, what? Wh Yes, yes, I'm on board, and I really do want, I, I think there's some good things happening. I think God's trying to, to do some things in my church. But this is why, let's be honest with ourselves. Why do we want this? Do you want it just because you want more people? Do you want it just because you want more money? Do you want it because you're afraid that your beloved church will die? Is that it? Or do you really have a passion for the gospel of Jesus Christ and reaching people in this community with him? If that's your motivation, we're going to get along great. Okay? If it's not, we're going to struggle. We're going to struggle. Okay? The other thing that's a major misconception is that people sometimes believe, and your church may have thought this when you brought me here, that you know what we need to save this church? We'll bring in somebody that's young, that can play the guitar, that can preach pretty good, and, and he'll be entertaining, and somehow that's going to bring people and transform this thing. That is the biggest load of baloney that you've ever heard in your life. Okay? That's just, that's just not, that's not true. It's not true. Jesus brought in humongous crowds. I mean, to the point where tens of thousands of people show up to listen to Jesus preach, like on hills. Like, you can't even count them all. There's so many people, and very few people came to Christ. Very few people uh, in that time, even with Je This was the Son of God, for crying out loud. And people are still turning away to the point where just, you know, Thursday, Friday morning, crucify him. So the idea that one guy or a couple guys are going to come in and just fix everything, that's not true. What's going to happen is that the congregation, the God is going to bring together people that share a passion and a vision for reaching the lost. Okay, And, and together we, we work on that. Now there's leadership. I'm not saying there's not leadership. And I think that's God. God's called me here. But it's, it's, it's not going to be some magic bullet. Well, hey, we don't have to do anything now because we call Dustin here. If that's your plan, then we need to talk again, right? And I don't think it is. I've had some good conversations with a lot of you, and they're like, no, we, we, we want to do it. We want to be the ones to do it. We want God to do the work, and we want him to use us in the process. All right, let's go to the Bible because uh, that's kind of where I usually spend my time. Uh, you might have noticed we got a bunch of new Bibles because I, I, I can't give you those little red Bibles there because uh, they're, they're donated. Um, but these, so we just bought a bunch, and these are better actually than those. Uh, they're on the back table. We got 24 of them so far, but if they're all gone tomorrow, I'll buy another 24. Or I'll buy another 50 or whatever. These are great Bibles. They're big print too. If you don't have a good, easy to read Bible uh, and, and you're semi-blind like myself, right? 
Uh, I can actually read this. So it's there. It's got some maps in it. Uh, it's got some little study stuff that you can read, intros to the chapters, and all these. These are great. If you've got a friend that you're talking to and you're talking about the Bible, they don't have a Bible, just take this. They're free. Take them. Take them. Give them to people. This is God's word. This is how God spoke to me. All right? This is how God speaks to all of us. All right? Turn to uh, Mark chapter 4 if you've got a Bible. And if you don't have a Bible, go back and get one. It's all right. We, we, some of you don't bring Bibles to church. That's all right. We'll, we'll, uh, we'll condemn you silently. Right? We'll, we'll get Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter 4. And, and I'm drawn to this because I'm driving around. You've got to remember where I'm coming from. I'm not coming from corn country. Or bean country. I'm coming from city, right? And so I'm just, all I see is corn. All, and all I feel is humidity <laughs> and heat. And I'm like, oh man, God, you're really, yeah, God, I love you, but boy, I'm, oh, thank you for this air conditioning in the car, God, you are good. So, um, it's the parable of the sower. It's about, it's about farming. Some people thought that the oldest profession was prostitution. It's not. It's farming. Um, here, here we go. It says, uh, again, verse 1, Again, Jesus began to teach by the lake. The crowd that gathered around him was so large that he got into a boat and sat in it out on the lake while all the people were along the shore at the water's edge. All right, so Jesus is out there. He's got his disciples with him. And people are starting to catch a little bit of vision from Jesus. They're seeing, but the vision that, that, that Jesus is laying down is different than the vision they're picking up. Okay. His vision is about the kingdom of God. It's about people coming to him, that it's a spiritual kingdom. They're picking up a vision that's different. The vision they're picking up is this vision that says he's going to throw, uh, overthrow Rome. Uh, this is going to be a physical type kingdom. And so they're not picking up the same thing he's laying down. And so here's what, here's what happens. He, he's there, and so there's this huge crowd. And he wants to tell a story because that's the best thing. So I'm going to tell you a story about Jesus telling a story. Here's what it says. It says uh, they were at the lake. Verse 2, he taught them many things by parables, and in his teaching said. First thing he says is, listen. Okay, if God tells you to listen, what should you do? You guys are you guys are sharp as a tack, you guys are. I like that. A farmer went out to sow seed. I don't know a lot about farming, but I've had some conversations with y'all, okay? And in those conversations, the, here's the one thing that I've gotten from Gay Ann and from, and uh, I've got it from, uh, from Ralph and I've got it from Jim and I've got, uh, here, they all tell me the same thing, uh, they all tell me the same, same thing, that the seed is expensive. Is that true? Is seed expensive? And that it, was, it wasn't as expensive before, but now it's like, and why is it so expensive? They, they, they're manu genetically altering the stuff or something? or what? It, by you? So we blame Ryan for all of our, all of our financial woes right now. But, but it's, all this is, but it's expensive, right? And so when I was watching you guys farm, because I'm watching, I'm learning as much as I possibly can because I'm trying to minister to this area. And I'm watching and I'm seeing that these people are, they've got like, very strategic plans on how they're going to... Now, some of those plans went, er, 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 right, pretty, pretty quickly after they made them, but, but they have strategic plans about how they're going to do this because they don't want to waste their money. They don't want to waste their seed. Okay, so I'm reading this, and this struck me weird. It says, he taught them many things by parables, this teaching. Listen, a farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants so that they did not bear grain. Still, other seed fell on good soil that came, uh, came up, grew, and produced a crop, some multiplying 30, some 60, some 100 times. Then Jesus said, whoever has ears to hear, not corn ears, but regular ears, to hear, let him hear. Does that strike any of you guys weird about farming? This guy stinks at farming. Doesn't he? Isn't this a really bad farmer? He sure seems like a bad farmer to me. I, if, if most of my seed doesn't bear a crop, 
Because the way I planted was to take seed and just start throwing it and scattering it. I mean, there's no prep. There's no nothing. He just takes seed, it says, and he scatters it. Is that how you guys farm? Do you just like start throwing it out? Do you buy a, a whole bu- a truckload of seed and you just start throwing it and saying, well, God, it's in your hands now. Boy, ha- have fun. Or, or do you actually have a plan where you put holes in the ground, maybe through a tractor or something like that, and the corn goes where you want it to go? I notice it's in rows, right? I've noticed that. It's not just like all over. I mean, I- I'm not the sharpest tool in the shed, but I figured that out. They don't just scatter it. But the kingdom of God is not just like farming. What I see here is like the song Reckless Love that we sang this morning. His his sowing of seed is is to the point of reckless. It's, it's, we, 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 we don't, we, I don't care. I'm just, whatever it takes to go out and get a crop. I'll spare no expense. I'll, I'll, sp- I'll spare no people. Uh, if, if I gotta, if I gotta hire more, if I, whatever I gotta do, I'm gonna do it. Because the mission is so intense. We're, there, he's not super calculated. He's scattering. Why is he scattering? Because God is, his love is so great and so deep for us. That, that he's not saying, well, I'm just, you know what, I'm just going to put it here. I don't want anything to grow there. I don't want anything to grow there. I'm just going to put something right here, and then I'm going to put something right here, and I'm going to make sure that these are all taken care of. That's not our job. See, there's a couple things I notice in this passage. The first thing, uh, first thing I notice here is that the farmer's style is irrelevant. So whether it grew or not, whether the, whether whether the seed grew wasn't dependent on the person sowing the seed. Do you notice that in the story? It's not. It's not like, it's not like uh, God said, wow, you know, I took some seed and I threw it behind my back. And then I took some seed and I went, be- went between the legs and I got some seed out in a certain way. And then, and then I did it with a, with a pitchfork, right? And I put the holes with that. And then, and then I took a little stick and I put that. And I, that was my style. We all have different styles. Is, is the kingdom of God and, and the, the growing of the crop, is it dependent on the style of the person sowing? That's my point. Is it dependent on that? has nothing to do with that. What's his style? Scatter. Preach the gospel, share the gospel with everybody. Well, they don't live in our town. Well, they have a criminal record. Oh, well, they have they, everybody. They all get the gospel. We sweep the whole thing, right? We sweep everybody. It's just scattered everywhere. That's a big deal. That's important for us to understand as we walk through this. The other thing I notice, and this is important, is that it's the same seed. It's the same exact seed. It's not like he's got, he doesn't have genetically altered seed. There's one kind of seed that God has. And it is the true gospel of Jesus Christ, which says that we are all sinners. We have fallen short of God's glory. We don't, we're we're crooked sticks. Every one of us, we're born crooked sticks. But only, only straight sticks get into heaven. And so when God, what God did is he died, he came down as a straight stick and they allowed him to make him crooked, to, to, to basically put, put all the sin of the world on Jesus Christ so that, so that when God looks at me, he sees a straight stick because he sees Jesus. He redeemed, he paid for my sin. That's, that's the point. That's the seed, the gospel of Jesus Christ. We are saved by Jesus and Jesus alone. And this varies very deeply from our Catholic friends that are next door. And I know you like to be friends with the Catholic. That's good. We can be friends, but we disagree on theology and we disagree on salvation. Salvation is this, that we are not saved by grace, uh, by grace and doing good things. We are saved by what Jesus does on the cross and that alone. When I die, I don't go to purgatory. I go to heaven. Why? Because I'm not, I'm not paying for my sins. Jesus paid for my sins. If Jesus paid for my sins and I still have to suffer for my sins, then I must think Jesus isn't isn't powerful enough to take care of my sins. The cross wasn't enough then, right? 
To me, that's offensive. To say that the cross was not enough offends me. Jesus did everything necessary, and I'm saved because I put my faith in him. I repent. I say, God, I'm not going to walk this way, the way I've walked before. I'm turning away from that, and I'm grabbing onto Jesus with both hands, and I'm never letting go. Okay? That's what, that's what our, that's the message. But what's happened in churches all over the country, especially in big cities, and it's happening in small towns too, whether you know it or not, even in small towns like this and Anawan, these small towns, I've, I noticed this right away, is that we have a genetically altered gospel. There is a genetically altered seed that's being shared with people. It's a seed that, that doesn't, doesn't rely completely on Jesus, that doesn't, that doesn't have the same vision and the same mission, that has a little bit of Catholic thrown in there, right? A little, it, it, and, and we've accepted it. We've said, you know what, you know what? it's all right, because can't we all just get along? Let's all get along. What's important is that we're together and that we all love God. Yeah, we do all love God. But are we all saved? There's a difference between believing in God and being saved. The devil believes in God. We are saved because we put our faith in Jesus Christ. So let's keep going here. Let's keep going. So what happens in this story? I'm, I'm not going to talk too much longer because I think I've, I think we've made made our points here. When he was alone, the twelve and others around him asked him about the parables. Right, because they're like, I, I, gee, Jesus, I don't know what you're talking about. That don't make no sense at all. What, what's the seed? What's the ground? What, oh, what's your symbolism here? And so Jesus wants us to know what he's talking about. So he explains the parable, and it's right here in the Bible. So he told them, the secret of the kingdom of God has been given to you. This story, this is the secret of the kingdom of God. But to those on the outside, everything is said in parables so that they may be ever seeing but never perceiving and ever hearing but never understanding. Otherwise, they might turn and be forgiven. That's a whole nother discussion that we can get into another time. Right now, we're focusing on the, pa the passage of the sower and who the seed is. Then Jesus said to them, don't you understand this parable? How then will you understand any parable? The farmer sows the word. The word, right? That's what he's sowing. God's word. The gospel is coming from God's word. Okay? That's where we're going to get everything. So as we go forward as a church, as long as I'm here, okay? As long as I'm here, as we go forward as a church, decisions will be made as far as what, how do we progress based on this. Okay? So you say, well, Dustin, I don't, I don't, I don't like that. I think that's, I think what you're doing is, is wrong. I say, okay, well, let's sit down. Let's have a discussion. I want you to bring your Bible, and I'll have my Bible, and we'll sit down, and we'll talk about it. And I guarantee, I, I promise you, I give you my word that if you show me from Scripture that something is wrong, that we're not going the right direction because the Bible is clear on it, you know, you're going in the wrong direction, I will repent. I give you my word. I'll repent if you show me from Scripture. But if it's just an opinion, right? If it's just an opinion or it's just a preference, you're like, well, you know, I, what, what's the problem? Well, I just don't like it. Well, then we have to talk about it. And that doesn't mean I don't care about your preferences. I do. I care about everybody's preferences. But they can't dictate the gospel. It can't trump the word. My own feelings don't come. Don't. There's a lot of things. Uh, trust me. Over the last year, there's a lot of things that my feelings were not the direction we went. We went contrary to feeling more than you can possibly imagine. And we went contrary to feeling because of this. Okay? We're not directed by feeling or by feeling secure or, or being happy. We're not directed by it. We're directed by this book, by God's word, by God himself. You got me excited. Now, let me, let me, let me get back to the word. Where, where am I? Jesus said to them, don't, oh yeah, blah, 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 there we go. Some people. Some people are like seed among the path where the word is sown. As soon as they hear, Satan comes and takes away the word that was sown in them. So there's a battle happening in this, in this uh, a spiritual battle that's happening in the sowing of seed, isn't there? Uh, we're not just sowing seed and, and Mother Nature just gives us seed or God just, there, there's an enemy trying to stop us, stop this from happening. I need to warn you, okay? I need to warn you that as we go forward here, there is an enemy 
Th this church, I don't think, has been very scary to the devil for a, for a while. I don't think the devil's like, oh boy, Atkinson Congregational Church, boy, they're really, they're really taking my kingdom away. Maybe, maybe, but I haven't sensed that. But, but we're on that direction, we're going to go there, and all of a sudden, all of a sudden, the devil's going to be mad. You're honing in on his territory, and he doesn't take that lying down, okay? He likes, he likes the way things are. He likes it. This is great. This is perfect. We'll just lull everybody in, and they'll come on Sunday. They'll feel good about themselves. It says, as soon as they hear it, Satan comes and takes away the word that was sown in them, trying to snatch it from them so that they don't, they don't receive the gospel. No, so, uh, it says, others, like seed sown on rocky places, hear the word and at once receive it with joy, and they're all excited. And then what happens? You don't ever see them again, right? They're all excited, and maybe they get baptized, and then they're gone, right? But since they have no root, they last only a short time. We gotta, there's got to be root. There has to be a place where they get rooted, Right? So that they grow in their faith. And we're not people that are just saying, all right, people are coming there, they get saved, they become a Christian, and that's it. That's not enough. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, because of the word, you see that? Because of the word. They quickly fall away. Still others, like seeds sown among thorns, hear the word, but the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, and the desires for other things come in and choke the word, making it unfruitful. Think about yourselves. Think about us as a church. Deceitfulness of wealth, desires for other things come in and are more important. You know my son is able to play baseball in Geneseo, but not on Sunday morning. No way he's playing on Sunday morning. There's no way I'm going to explain. My son's like, I can't play on Sunday morning. No. Why? Because that's other things that are secondary to me helping him grow. My job is to help him grow to love God so that he leads people to, to Christ and, he, and he's, he's a, a functioning follower of Christ. And people say, well, you know, we're really busy. We haven't, been, we haven't been to church for a while because we're just so busy. We got so much going on, so busy. Okay, I get that. I can be patient with that. I understand that. But I want you to take a good look at what we value and where you value. And as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And when he's 20, he can make a decision, but I bet you he'll decide. I bet you he's going to make the decision because he knows why. He knows why. But the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth and desires for other things come in and choke the word. Others like seeds sown on good soil hear the word, accept it, and produce a crop. Some 30, some 60, some 100 times what was sown. Just an incredible passage. Just an incredible passage. What's our motivation? What's our motivation? Here's what I see in this passage. This is a, a vision that I have for us as a church. And I, I want you to grab onto this and think about it. And, and what we're going to be doing is, what we're trying to do right now is kind of package this into a way where it's easy for people to understand. Not just people here, but outside. I don't want there to be any question from anybody in the community about what this church stands for and what this church is about. This church is about Jesus reaching people with the gospel and helping them grow in their faith so that they go out and we train them to go out and reach other people who they come here. And so here, good motivation. Good motivation is people, passionate people. That's the motivation is passion. The motivation is a passion in your heart, a love for God, a, a, a transforming, something has been transformed in you and it's God in you, the Holy Spirit's transforming you and saying, yes, I want you to be a part of this. I want you to be here. I want you to do this. And you're like, I have a passion. I can't not. One of the reasons we're here, and I, I question this all the time, and I shouldn't, but one of the reasons we're here is that I remember talking to my wife, and I said, I'm afraid. She goes, what are you afraid of? I said, I'm afraid that if I don't go, God's going to do something there, and I'm going to miss it. I'm not going to be there when God does it, and God's given me an opportunity here to be a part of that, and I won't be there and then I'm going to look and I'm going to say, well, God, because God can do it with anybody. He doesn't need me. He can have anybody, right? But, but I'm going to look and say, wow, 
Wow, look at what happened. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to feel like uh, I missed the boat, right? Good motivation. Passionate about people sprouting and growing into fully mature believers who go out and recklessly scatter seed because of a passion to see people sprouting and growing into fully mature believers who go out and recklessly scatter seed because of a passion to see people sprouting and growing into fully mature believers who go out and recklessly scatter seed because of a passion to see people sprouting and growing into fully mature believers who go out and recklessly scatter seed because of a passion to see people sprouting and growing into fully... You, you get the picture? It, 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 it goes on and it goes on and it goes on. And, and, and my vision, I see this church growing and I see as people, people uh, getting saved in the area. I see people being baptized. I see people growing in their faith. And I see this church growing to the point where we've got people coming from Anawan and we've got people coming from all these little towns. And the next thing you know, we've got more people than we really can have here. So all of a sudden, what does our church do? We plant a church. We get another pastor who can pastor the church in Anawan. And now they're growing and they're doing the same thing. And they're reaching people with the gospel. And we're transforming the, we're transforming the culture of what, what God has been doing here to something that's more on track with what I believe God wants in this community. Okay? Are you picking up what I'm laying down? I hope so. I hope so. I want you to know I didn't make this up. <laughs> um, I'm not that smart. I'm just not. And if I did make it up, I'd be even scared to death. The great thing about this vision is that it's right in the Bible. We just read it. We just read about it. Even if I'm out to lunch in a total freak show, which nobody answer that, <laughs> but even if that's the case, you still can rely not on Pastor Dustin, but on this, God's Word. Because the mission is clearly in here, the Great Commission and the Great Commandment. And the vision is that this church become, become the, the avenue and the place that God uses. And why will God use us? Because we're willing because we're willing. We're willing. That's it. We say, yeah. You're in charge, God. And I'm willing. Will you guys, will you join me on my, on my mission to reach people with the gospel? I died on the cross for you. I died for all these people and they're not hearing the gospel. W would you join me? You are my people. You are my hands and feet. Will you join me in making that happen? Well, we're not real organized in that specifically. Well, let's get organized and let's do it. Okay? That's my vision. That's my mission. It says in, uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, What, after all, is Apollos? This is Paul talking. And what is Paul? Only servants through whom came to believe. As the Lord has assigned to each the task, I planted seed. Apollos watered, but God has been making it grow. So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but only God who makes things grow. The one who plants and the one who waters have one purpose. The one who plants and the one who waters, they have one purpose. Hmm, I wonder what that would be. That might be important. They will each be rewarded according to their own labor, for we are co-workers of God's service. You are God's field, God's building. God wants to use us in this process. We're not the ones that, that grow. So our job isn't to save people. Okay? You're going to scatter seed all over, and I want you to be encouraged that some of that seed is not going to grow. Okay? Some of that seed's not going to grow. Is that our fault? No, it's not our fault. Right? God's the one that makes it grow. God's the one that draws people to himself. Say, well, if we had a really good pastor that really knew how to share the gospel really creatively, we could really, you know, manipulate them into believing. No, 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 no. We just have to share the seed. What's the seed? The seed is the gospel of Jesus Christ, right? We're going to sow that seed, talk about Jesus, and let God do something. And I'll tell you what, you're going to be way more satisfied, way more happy. Way more joyous, way more excited, way more wanting to be here every Sunday, way more ready to tell people about your church when you're telling them about what God is doing and not what we're doing. Because I don't care what we're doing. I just want to be a part of what God's doing. So God, pull us into your, your plan here. Pull us in. 
Let us be a part of it. He's the king. He's our leader. He's our Lord. He's our head. He's in charge of the thing. You want your church to thrive? You want to see baptisms? You want to, you want to see people getting saved? You want to see Sunday school full? Then we got to get back to God's purpose and his clear vision of, of seeing people come to Christ. And we're going to have to work together to make that happen. You can't just hire a pastor and say, hey, pastor, make that happen. It doesn't work that way. The greatest job that I have is not to preach on Sunday. The most important job that I have is not to uh, meet with people in the nursing home, though those are important things. It's not to prep the music on Sunday or, or uh, talk to EJ on the phone or take kids to Channel Cat. That, my job, my primary job as a pastor is to cast vision. That's my primary job. To lead us toward this vision, to encourage us, and to help prepare us to fulfill that. That's it. That's it. Are you on board? Are you excited about what God's going to do? I want to let you know I'm going to let you down. I'm going to make mistakes in the process. You're going to let me down. You're going to make mistakes in the process. I'm going to question some things you do. You're going to question some things I do. And when it all comes down, we're going to come back to this book. We're going to sit down because we love each other. Because we're all kids of, of G, we're all God's chi, God kids, you know. We're going to sit down as a family. We're going to talk stuff out. We're going to look and say, hey, God, what are you telling us? You know, can you figure this out? If you're excited about this, I could use some encouragement this morning. Okay? I could use some encouragement. You have on your, you have in front of you, you have a communication card. Okay? We're going to sing a hymn and, uh, let, let's do this a little bit different. If you don't mind, Randy, we'll do this a little bit different. If you could have the basket just in the back as people are leaving today. Um, I'm going to have EJ uh, play our last song, and we'll just kind of take a minute. I want you to write on there, you know, I'm in. Um, this is my passion, too. I want you to say, you know what? I'm, I'll even be encouraged if some people say, you know what, Dustin? This isn't me. Because at least then we know. At least then we know, right? And we can talk about it some more. We can go from there. You say, hey, Dustin, I, I don't know. Boy, that, that's so much different than what I'm used to. Put that down. God, Dustin, I'm praying for this. Put down. I, I want you to communicate to me today. Help me to understand. And if I don't get a communication card from you, I want you to call me on the phone. Or come in here in the morning on Monday. Or I'm here on Monday and Thursday in the morning. But let's, uh, let's just pray for God to do some great things. God, in Jesus' name. God, we're asking for you to, to guide us and lead us. And God, all we're, we don't know what to do. All we know is that we're your kids and that you want to see your gospel shared all over this area. You want everybody to know the gospel. And you want people to hear your word and to grow from your word. So we want to sow the word all over the place. The Bible's going to be our guide. It's... it's but God, we need you to come. We need you to encourage us. We need you to fill us with your spirit. God, we need you to open up doors that couldn't be opened before so that we, that we see your power at work. God, we need, we need you to start bringing people from outside of our church who haven't been a part of this that, that share that vision and say, you know, we're in with you. We're going to bring us people from Anawan. God, bring us people from Mineral. God, bring us people from, uh, from Cambridge or even from Genesee, wherever. God, just bring us some people to help us to fulfill your mission. God, the workers are few. God, bring them here in Jesus' name. Amen.